Hello class, this is Miss Augustine. We are still in Chapter 2. We're still talking about matter. And today we're going to start to talk about elements. Elements and compounds. So what do I mean when I say elements? Elements are the simplest form of matter that can exist under normal conditions. Um, and they are the building blocks for all other substances. So, ding, 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 spoiler alert, you can expect there to be a question on a test that asks you this kind of thing. So, when we're talking about elements and the building blocks for all other substances, I'm going to mention that you probably learned about elements at the junior high, and you may even have talked about the periodic table a little bit. You might have talked about um, atoms and uh, the like. So for now, let's just concentrate on elements a little bit. So when we talk about the elements, there are roughly 118 known elements. They reside on the periodic table. All matter in the universe is composed of these very same elements. And elements are represented by either a one or two letter chemical symbol. Um, now, in chemistry class, we're going to be talking about elements quite a lot, as you might imagine. And so you will have received from me a um, handout called uh, Elements. And what we do is we all use the same page. And there are 36 elements on that sheet. And we will quiz you on them. And Generally speaking, I quiz you on the first 19 elements, and then the second 19 elements, and then one quiz on the whole page of 36 of them. Um, in chemistry class, you will not need to memorize all 118 known elements. There are roughly 36 or 40 or so that we'll talk about quite a bit, and those are the ones that you'll need to be able to recognize um, their symbols. So there are rules for element symbols. The first letter is always capitalized. If you're one of those folks who likes to write in all lower case on a quiz, I sadly get, cannot give you credit for that. When you're doing symbols in chemistry class, the first letter is always capitalized. If it's only a one letter symbol, it shall be a capital letter. And the second letter, if present, is always lower case. So if you write two caps or two lower case, I would have to mark it incorrect. So the reason we use these symbols is no matter where you are on planet Earth, we've all agreed to use the same symbols. And so we all have to follow the same symbol conventions. So the names of the elements were derived um, from Latin and Greek names for the most part. And so their symbols don't always match what the name is. And that's because the symbols come from the Latin and Greek names. And again, as I just stated, the symbol does not always match the common name of the element. Chemical symbols, however, are the international chemical language. And so we all agree to the same ones. So compounds can be separated into simpler substances, um, and compounds are made up of elements. And they can be um, separated into their individual elements only by chemical means. So for example, when you burn the compound sugar, all that's left is going to be elements. So before it is cooked, it is a compound. It might be glucose or sucrose. And afterwards, all we would have left would be the elements, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Which leads us to talking about burning sugar, a chemical reaction. So what do we mean by a chemical reaction? And that is what happens when one or more substances combine to form into a new substance or substances. So my example I like to use is rust. If you have iron and it is exposed to oxygen, eventually they will combine and you will get iron free oxide, which is commonly referred to as rust. So 
the iron when it started was a gray metal, oxygen was a clear colorless gas, and when they form iron 3 oxide, they have both changed and now you have that orange powder that we call rust. So when you talk about a chemical reaction, there are generally two sides to a chemical reaction. There are the reactants, or the starting substances, and there are the products, or the substances that are formed or produced. So reactants react to form products. The products are produced. So that leads to the question of, well, what is meant then by a chemical property? So the ability of a substance to undergo a chemical reaction and to form a new substance is a chemical property. And chemical properties are only observed when there is a chemical change. So for instance, I can look at a piece of paper sitting on my desk and I can say to myself, self, I wonder if that's flammable. The only way I'm going to really know if it's flammable, and flammable would be a chemical property, would be to try to light it on fire. And when it ignites, then I can say, oh, it's flammable. So chemical properties are observed when a chemical change is taking place. So that leads to the question, what is a chemical change? Chemical changes have certain things that let you know they're a chemical change. The first thing is an energy change. You mix two things together and they either get hot, that's a positive energy change, or they get cold, negative energy change. They change color. My paper was white and after it's burned all that's left is ash. There's an odor change. My paper didn't have any odor at all and then once it caught fire, it smelled like burning paper. So again, change in odor. And the formation of a new substance. So in the case of my burning paper example, I will see vapor coming off of it, the smoke, and I will see the formation of ash. So when I say formation of a new substance, you mix two things together that were liquid and a solid forms or you mix two solids together and they turn into a liquid, or you mix two substances together and it bubbles, a gas is formed. So in general, if you're ever asked, ding, 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 possible test question, if you're ever asked, what are the signs of a chemical change? They would be one, energy change, two, color change, three, odor change, four, formation of a new substance. So when we talk about chemical changes, we mean the formation of new substances. And so chemical changes may only be reversed through a chemical means. Physical changes may be reversed because they do not involve a change in composition. However, I'm going to say some physical changes are either easier to reverse than others. So for instance, physical change. I um, melt an ice cube so it goes from water in the solid state to water in the liquid phase. I can reverse that by putting it in the freezer and it turns to ice again. Others are not as easy. There's still physical changes, but for instance, if I took a raw egg and threw it against the wall, physical change, there's still egg and there's still shell, but reversing it is not quite as easy. Think in terms of Humpty Dumpty who sat on the wall, you know, and all the king's horses and all the king's men, etc. So this leads us to our last slide, and this is about the law of conservation of mass. Earlier on in chapter one, I said that laws are concise statements that express the reality. No matter how many experiments you do, this is what's going to happen. And so the law of conservation of the mass is the first law we'll encounter. And it states that in any physical change or chemical reaction, mass is neither created nor destroyed. It is always conserved. So what that means is that whether you're melting ice or freezing water or whether you're reacting 
a chemical reaction, burning a piece of paper, you can always account for all of the mass that was involved. So that means that the mass of the reactants always equals the mass of the products. Now sometimes it's a little tricky to do, so if you're burning a piece of paper, it's hard to account for all of that mass because some of that went off as carbon dioxide and water vapor, for instance. However, if you set your mind to it, you can always account for all of the mass in a physical and chemical change. So that's where we're saying that matter is conserved and mass is conserved. It's not created or destroyed. It's rearranged in some way, but you can always account for it. So that concludes the chapter two notes. This is Miss Augustine signing off.